So, um, hi everybody. Uh, thanks, welcome to this artist talk with LJ Roberts, um, being presented both in person here in Joshua Tree um, and online. Great to see you here. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that Boxo Project is located on the traditional lands of the Serrano, Kawea, and Chimaweve people, um, and invite anybody on Zoom to consider whose land they're located on. Um, I'm really excited uh, for this artist talk with LJ. Uh, LJ is uh, someone who's very well known and, and very well exhibited on the East Coast and not so much uh, to date locally. Um, I'm very excited when they approached me. They have bought a home in the area and approached me uh, recently about spending some time working in the studio here at Boxo before uh, they managed to create a studio for themselves up at 6,000 feet up on the mountain. Um, but I was really excited. Uh, There's a bit of a phenomenon these days of, you know, we have a, a number of artists living and working in Joshua Tree whose work uh, we don't often get to see. So um, it's really exciting uh, to have LJ here um, and specifically to have them present their work to you in some organized fashion. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to LJ and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks for coming today. And huge thanks to Bernard, because I basically emailed and said, I need a studio. Can you help me? <laughs> and he got back to me right away and said, of course. Um, and this has been a complete dream space to work in and a really great model for what Fox will probably eventually end up doing on the land, right, Fox? So um, anyhow, it's great to be back here because I first moved here in 2014 um, with my partner. And we bought a cabin with no electricity and water in 2016. Um, and we say the cabin found us because it kind of truly did. So it's been really nice to be living out here again. Um, and even though I have to go back to New York soon, but um, so thank you so much, Bernard, for your wonderful hospitality for me and my dogs. And um, Jared, love the company. yeah, we, it's been really dog friendly residencies are the best. And um, so without further ado, so I always start with this image um, and, and I'll just give like a brief history and then kind of go into three recent projects, which I think will give you um, a bit of a kind of idea of what I do, but I always start with this image, which is um, the AIDS quilt. And this was the last time it was laid out in its entirety on the mall in Washington. And um, I was a child that was always in trouble. And I also was like very, I don't know, gender non-conforming queer child. And I was sent away to an all girls Episcopal boarding school in Maryland. And um, I was either 15 or 16 and I got up the guts one day to sign up for this field trip to go see the AIDS quilt. And I was the only person that signed up for the field trip and I went with a chaperone that I didn't know. <laughs> so to say it was awkward would be an understatement. Um, and, oh. Oh, it's not? There we go. That worked? Okay, got it. Um, so it was, a, it was a very momentous occasion because I think that you realized the scope of the epidemic and there was a lot of grief. And when you're having sex ed as a 13 year old, 14 year old during this time and nothing makes sense because you're queer and trans and um, also you know about AIDS, it can be really terrifying. So this was a big moment, but it was also a big moment because it was kind of the first time I had seen like a lexicon of kind of queer symbology, I guess, or words or associations. And growing up where I did, that didn't exist at all. It was it just didn't exist. So um, I ended up getting a t-shirt from the Names Project and I would only wear it in my dorm room when no one was looking, but it was a really important moment. And um, people always ask me like the influence it had on my work. And I think like, obviously there's connections, but it, I can't even quantify it because it just was such a, it was like extremely life-defining um, this field trip. 
And then I went to college at the University of Vermont and around 2000, I started in 1999 and um, I was an English major. I majored in um, critical theory and poetry and um, took some sculpture classes because I finished my degree early and then I injured myself. So I started knitting my work. My grandmother had taught me to knit um, when I was a child, she learned her, from her grandmother, who was an immigrant from Eastern Europe. Um, and so it was kind of passed down to me. I'm actually named after her and she sported the family as a seamstress. So these kind of like matrilineal skills. And I started knitting my work because it kind of materially held in it all of the things I was interested in learning literary theory. Um, in terms of gender and class and race and associations of ver vernaculars um, and different ways of writing, different ways of looking at poetry. So I knitted this, it says mom knows now. And I snuck up to the tallest building at the University of Vermont without permission and hung it um, as kind of a banner drop. I was living with a lot of people who were active in Earth First. I was living in a radical environmental co-op, which was um, pretty great. And so I had learned a lot from them, but I was also looking at a lot of work by Grand Fury and Fierce Pussy and Dyke Action Machine, and also kind of work that was done by ACT UP and Affinity Groups. So this was kind of a first foray into um, knitting the work and uh, showing textiles, but in a way that didn't really deal with institutions. I never thought I would really do much with art, but then I decided to go to grad school. I went to California College of Arts and Crafts for textiles, um, and then they dropped the word craft from their name. So I kind of did the same thing. So my first open studios, I snuck in at six o'clock in the morning, grabbed the tallest ladder I could find, had knitted the word and crafts and stuck it up back on the sign without permission. And I used E6000 glue, um, which if you've ever worked with it, it like sticks to everything and anything and you can't, it's really permanent. And, and um, so people were really into this project because everyone didn't want the name to change, but I didn't realize that um, they were filming like the promotional video for the school the next day. <laughs> so I got him. They weren't really happy with me. And then I was like, well, I'm just gonna leave it up there because it's a permanent gift to the school. And after a week, they like finally convinced me to, to put it down. It's actually, this project is in the Oakland Museum of California now, um, along with like an oral history and documentation, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna skip this too, except, oh, there we go. Um, so this is a project that I guess, no pun intended, put me on the map because it is a map. But um, I moved to Brooklyn after grad school in 2008. And there was a really kind of vibrant scene happening there. There were lots of queer collective houses, um, a lot of people working together in kind of a very grassroots way. Um, and a friend of mine, Rosa Daniel Ling Levitsky, drew this really beautiful map of all the queer collective houses. Um, and their kind of place on the map. And I saw this thing and was just like, this is the most beautiful map I've ever seen in my entire life. And all the houses had names, um, for instance, like Maryland Mansion or um, Glitter House was one or Den of Sin. Um, and I actually was on a fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University. I was very, very homesick. And I was asked, long story short, the Smithsonian had um, censored David Wainerovich's work in a portrait show so called Hide Seek. And I'd written all these angry letters and like marched and um, probably with Jennifer and, um, <laughs> and uh, done like all this work with my kids, my students to write the Smithsonian. And I got this email back and I thought it was gonna be like, thank you for your concern. And instead they asked for a portfolio. Um, and they wanted this at the Renwick, which is like their craft gallery for a show called 40 Under 40. 
So I proposed this map and I said, if you're gonna let me make it, like you really gotta let me make it. So it's, it's knitted on the outside and then quilted on the inside. And then I use these toys. This is like a Barbie knitting machine and a cool quarter that you buy off the internet to make a lot of my work. So it's like, this is basically made with toys. And um, there's a detail of it. So you can kind of like see how it's knitted all done on toys. And then there are these buttons that you can take away for free. Um, they have the name of the house and then an illustration that represents kind of the character of the house that were done by my friend Buzz Slutsky. Um, it's, it's sort of in the vein of a work of works by Felix Gonzalez Torres where you can take things away and they exit the institution and that was a really important part of the piece um, that if it was going to go into a museum that it also exit and circulate around. So it's really fun for me to these buttons like I still see them all over the place. Um, and they also have like a lot of really queer content on it. And it was an interesting process to work with the museum to make sure that the, there was like no censorship that was going to happen, especially because it was in the craft galleries, which tend to be a lot more kind of like conservative and traditional, even more so than something like the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and then after I finished that, I ended up going back to New York and unable to afford a studio. And I lived in this tiny itsy bitsy apartment that was wonderful, but about the size of a closet. And I started uh, embroidering portraits of my friends. I forgot to bring the one I'm working on right now. Oh, maybe I did. I can't remember. I'll see afterwards. But this is about um, six by four inches. And I put it in a tote bag and I just carry the embroideries wherever I go. And I work on them in the subway or on the airplane or at lectures or at parties. I'm really fun. Um, <laughs> or at the beach, like I'm just constantly kind of embroidering. Um, so I started making these portraits. I took this of my friend Ted Kerr when we were at um, the 25th anniversary ACT UP um, protest on Wall Street. And one of the things that I do is I show the backs of them and I like showing the front and the back because it kind of makes fi the figurative and the abstract interdependent on one another. So there's a queering of the portrait that happens. And then there's also this kind of breaking down of the binary because they exist as kind of the same entity, but in very kind of like different forms. Um, and I can, I'll show you how those are displayed, but um, I just included a few um, to show you. And this was just actually a show at Pioneer Works. I did, I showed 10 years of portraits and the book is down on the floor so people can look at that. And um, so there's 26 total. This is my friend, Chris Jones. A lot of these people are my collaborators. So Chris and Ted and I actually, and our friend Nick Naz actually made a film together about the politics of condom use um, because Chris is a AIDS activist who lives in Harlem, so is Ted, though Ted doesn't live in Harlem, he lives in Covington. Um, but you can see like the front and then the back. And yeah, 26 in total. Um, we had them lined up chronologically, Alex Gallo and Esther McGowan in front of um, Zoe Leonard's I Want a President. So this was on the High Line. Um, that's the theorist Jose Esteban Munoz and Jean Vaccaro. Jean is currently one of the curators at the One Archive at USC. Um, this was after the day after gay marriage passed at the Dyke March. So I, I mean, it's just like a great image. <laughs> I mean, if you really wanted to make money, you would be a gay divorce lawyer, right? <laughs> um, so that's the back. And then this was the presentation at Pioneer Works. Um, this opened in September and closed in November. And it's traveling to the Cantor Center for the Arts at Stanford in late April and will be up until November. And the thing with the presentation is that they're framed and they're hinged to the wall. So you can actually turn the portraits like a book and see the back of the embroidery. Um, I don't know if I think I put that in, but the book is the same way where you have the front of the embroidery on one page and then you turn it and you can see the back and each of the embroideries. Um, functions in that way. And then 
I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the other kind of work I do, which are these big quilts. You kind of saw the first example with the map. And what you're seeing in the studio now is the very beginnings of a new quilt. Um, but this is a zine by my friend um, Damien, who goes by Hadassah Deluxe when she writes, called Manifesto. It's all about queer and trans conversion van culture. Um, <laughs> It is brilliant. It's like, not only are there van stories, but it's like how to buy a van, how to maintain a van, what kind of van you should get, um, things you need to be aware of. It's like, an, it's like a manual basically, but then it also has these great stories. And it has the story of the Van Dykes who were like a separatist group of lesbians in the seventies who decided not to live on, to occupy land, but to travel around in vans. And there's a great story in the New Yorker by Ariel Levy about the Van Dykes, but they didn't take themselves very seriously and they would like blow up each other's vans if someone slept with someone's girlfriend or something. And then I got really interested in kind of these like contemporary narratives. And I would sometimes go in Damien's van around the country. Um, and then I started thinking about movies like Born in Flames. Um, this is like something I put together when I talked to my students, but um, I was interested in like bringing together the past, the present and the future of this like queer and trans conversion man culture and like wrestling and remixing the legacies that are sometimes like problematic. And then thinking about like queer kinship, nomadism, landlessness, movement and identity and how those all have a lot of possibilities but also problems to them. Um, and then I was also like, <laughs> this was before COVID but I deal with a lot of like post-apocalypse anxiety all the time. Um, and I had been watching like Born in Flames and reading Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler and watching Stranger Things. And I'm also a Detroiter. I'm actually a fifth generation Detroiter. My parents corrected me, um, but I'm like obsessed with cars and vehicles and uh, in a, a really big way. So I ended up this is in Slab City. I took a lot of these photos when I was living here in 2014, 2015, but, um, and I do a lot of like camping and staying with the dogs in the van. So that's them down there. Um, this is where I first lived in Yucca Valley. Uh, this, this van was used for hay storage for the goats, but I took care of these goats and chickens. Um, this was my studio. This is so fun to talk about here. This was my <laughs> studio in North Joshua Tree. Um, so I started work on this piece that you'll see kind of in this studio. I drove with it across country on top of my car when we moved into this place, um, which is off Winters Road. And I should have like put the piece so you could see it, but I was working in here and then there was really bad forest fires the summer of 2015. I don't know if people remember that. Um, there were scorpions under the piece. So this is the piece rolled up in my in my yard in North Joshua Tree. Um, you can see the corner of the farm, the olive farm in the picture. Um, and basically what happened was I was working on it. This is the start of it. But the Museum of Arts and Design was like, we're going to move your whole studio into the third floor of the new Museum of Arts and Design. And you're going to work in on the third floor and anyone can come see it for like three months, which kind of makes you a zoo animal. Like people come and watch you work, but it was like an 800 square foot studio. It was amazing. And so my studio was shipped from Joshua Tree to Museum of Arts and Design. Um, this is like van ephemera, but also knitting ephemera because I use all of the toy knitting machines to work with. Um, and friends came and like hung out while I worked. So you can imagine like, this kind of drawing with the fabric on it will kind of get built in the same way as you're seeing on screen. This was a work in pro progress. So um, at the end of my residency at the museum, then I had a resident, I had worked on it, a bunch of residencies and an artist named Jim Hodges studio. It was like a similar situation to Bernard's where I was like, I need a place to work. And my friend Nelson was like, I'm going to have you put it at Jim Hodges studio, which was pretty incredible. People were very generous with space. Um, and then this is a week before actually lockdown started in New York at Spring Break Art Show. 
and I finished the van in 2020. So I worked on it from 2014 to 2016. Um, these are some details. So it's got its own like van language. So there's, you know, when it's supposed to be like vampire, it's vampire. So my favorite is van tankerous across the gas tank. Um, and then it was put in an exhibition in Toledo in November of 2020. So I thought before I'd show the piece, I would show it getting put on the wall. So there's like 10 giant people having to do this, like burly Midwesterners. Um, so that's how big it is. All starting in a, a indoor outdoor porch in North Joshua Tree with scorpions. <laughs> Museum conservators, like give me such side eye. Um, and that's the piece now. So um, yeah, it's it's huge. It's like 20 by 14 by 20. And then I have another ship that's in my studio um, in New York. Actually, it's in storage and we'll go into a studio in New York in April. And then this piece that I've just started. So I have basically have like a sketchbook of all of these vehicles and vessels that I'm making these big quilts out of um, as hopefully like a solid body of work that I'll finish by 2030. And um, here's just some more details of it. But this was all made on children's knitting machines and hand sewn. This was sewn on the sewing machine, but I use a lot of repurposed things like these zippers were all from materials for the arts, which is like a free, a place where you can get free art supplies. These are recycled bike tires, um, shoelaces. So it's also my friend Ariel Goldberg pointed out this is like words as tools, um, creating your own language. Um, that's from the bike tire. I used uh, light brights for the tail lights and um, hacked them so that they, they like blink on and off. Um, and then this is the last project I put in because um, most people think of me as working in textiles, but I actually work in a lot of different ways. And I'm now doing a bunch of um, projects in neon and light boxes. But also while I was out here, I made this artist book called Bricks and Stone that was responding to um, the US government under President Obama trying to make Stonewall into a monument and or a national monument. And people had a lot of feelings about that. Um, and I'm a New York Times reader, like a very dedicated New York Times reader. And there were articles coming out about it. And the first one left out lesbians and trans people and like all people of color. And I guess a lot of people complained about it because this correction came out that was like really snooty and mad. And I thought this correction was amazing. So I decided to kind of build this book about visibility and invisibility and kind of the fight that queer and trans folks have with like mainstream queer trans communities, like inner kind of like dialogues and conflicts over narrative, because there was like a lot of fighting about who threw the first brick. And to me, like that is not the most important thing. It's like the work that was done beforehand, the work that was done after. But then there was also, I remember this obituary of this woman, Stormy De La, De La Verrier, um, who was this amazing um, mixed race butch from Louisiana, who was a drag king and like kind of the guardian of the West Village, was a bouncer at um, the Cubby Hole, which is a like queer bar that's like mostly serves like dykes and AFAB folks um, till she was in her 90s. And I was like, wait a minute, like, why are all these people, this obit was written in 2014, like, why are all these people forgetting that she was the, like, people were like, she was definitely at Stonewall and she was there and she had disappeared in two years from like the New York Times. Um, and then I turned that book into this light box installation for a show called Nobody Promised You Tomorrow at the Brooklyn Museum that was for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Um, so the light boxes are basically a collaged archive made a, onto giant microfiche 
because I'm I'm like an analog lover. I love all things analog, especially archives on microfiche. So um, it's basically a collaged archive taking articles from the New York Times and reconfiguring them to talk about Stormy's life and then to also talk about why these narratives are so contested and kind of other dialogues that can happen around that. Um, and so last week, this was actually after an extremely long process that was intense, um, was just actually acquired by the National Portrait Gallery. So that it's a really cool, like to me, like this considered as a portrait is a really beautiful thing to talk about. That's the oscillator. Um, so it makes the light box boxes like flash in a rhythm. And I think that's it. That's me at the opening feeling very relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of lost my mind making it with all thanks to Light Bright Neon who are my amazing fabricators. So, okay, thanks. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Are there any questions for Andre? I'll start with them. And also for, for anybody on the Zoom, uh, feel free to put any questions into the chat and LJ will check for that <laughs> as a setup. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, part of what you're doing in the studio right now is prepping for a couple of upcoming shows and perhaps you could just talk about those. Yeah, I have. So I'm in a show at the Aldrich Museum of Art in Ridgefield, Connecticut, that's called 52 Artists. And they're basically pairing, they're revisiting a show, I think that was in the 70s that had 26 feminist artists with kind of like a new generation. But I think I'm the oldest artist in the show. <laughs> um, it's like all artists born since 1980 and I am the 1980. So um, I'm actually, I guess you can, I can hold them up, but I keep this ongoing archive of images that I've taken mostly during travels of, um, I just call it like a queer photo archive of like these images that I find interesting or unusual that maybe aren't super overt, but feel like they say something really powerful to me. Um, Would you mind bringing them over here for the, oh, uh, sure. for the virtual audience? This is actually, and I can help. this is down the street from my house. And I've done, I'm doing a lot of work with this image right now. We call it the rec room. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually building this kind of like two-sided light box. And I don't have a print here, but it's like a photo I took in Detroit, which is where I'm from. And someone took one of those like fire extinguishers and wrote like dike really huge on a building. So that'll be one side of the light box. And then there's this, it's actually a photo I took like right near Noah Purifoy a really long time ago of like all this fabric caked with dirt. And then I'm digging up stones from the museum, the grounds of the museum. And someone I know who live in lives in Ridgefield, who was my camp counselor when I was sent to fat camp as a 13 year old. But she was like my great gay hope. And she kept me like she kept me alive. She was like, I'm 21, you are 13. And I'm gonna write you letters. And we're gonna stay in touch. And you're gonna you're gonna stay alive. Like you're I'm not gonna let you not see adulthood. So she actually lives in Ridgefield with her wife and her kids. And I'm gonna dig stones from their yard and build like this kind of like messy stone wall that has this light box coming out of it. So you can have like, it's like a little bit of like a, I guess a, the next piece from the kind of stormy um, and consideration of Stonewall that like you can have a Stonewall anywhere and everywhere. And that like a revolution is maybe just like your camp counselor writing you letters when you were 13 so that you didn't kill yourself. Like that's important. So yeah. <laughs> She was like, what? You're digging stones out of my yard? Like, what are my kids going to think about this? But, but um, yeah, we're still friends. I guess our friendship now is like 28 year friendship or something like that. And we've kept in touch. And it was like literally 
three weeks that we spent together at this camp and she's still a big part of my life. So, yeah. Questions? Fabric donations? You know, a lot of people like try to give me fabric donations and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Like my neighbor who was a weaver was like, take all of this. And I've just, I carried it around for like years and years and years. And I was finally like, this has to go to kids who are knitting. Like, I'm just not gonna use it. Um, Cause my palette is like pretty specific, but every once in a while I'll have something. I mean, right now I'm just like tearing apart my clothes and using <laughs> like, I actually like, this is, I always have one black sweater that I wear all the time. And this was it for a really long, it was not a sweater vest, don't worry. I just been like <laughs> cutting up the sleeves to put in it. But like, I end up like, yeah, these are old leg warmers that just like did not work with my gender. I thought they would and they didn't. So it, it's like fabric, it's a combination of fabric I buy and then like cutting on my clothing. But I mean, if you want to tell me about your donations, I might. No, I I black leather is something I always need. Black yeah. Yeah, I'm cutting apart these shorts too that are, um, this is a really funny one where, so I adopted my dogs from Yucca Valley. They were in a foster and Sparky was a puppy and he like, these were my favorite shorts for a really long time. Not that I would ever fit in them now but he like chewed a hole right here. <laughs> and I took them down to the leather store in Palm Springs to like get them repaired. <laughs> and it just like didn't, I mean, they did a great job, but it just like, again, like wasn't gonna work for me. So I've been cutting them up too. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, a lot of the quilts and stuff have clothing or like things I've been dragging around forever or, um, you know, and I have a lot of fun like buying all the red light bright, bright pegs off eBay. Like that's something I did the summer of 2020 that was a weird thing about the pandemic was like basically skyrocketing the price of light bright pegs on eBay because mm -hmm. of, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about this piece? Oh yeah. So it's um the boat that it's based on is on that wall right there. It's a boat that was in Sweden. Um, I did a residency in Sweden called Iaspis in 2018 that was really wonderful. Um, and. Oh, Adrian has a question too. And uh, so I took a lot of pictures of the boats there because the waterways are kind of how you get around a lot. And I liked this little fishing boat because it was very pirate-like, but then it was also very kind of like gentle and non-threatening, <laughs> which felt like me. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm calling it a pleasure cruise fishing boat. And it's gonna have a lot to do with kind of cruising culture, um, playing off a lot of the names of the clubs in New York that no longer exists. Like I have this t-shirt from the from this club called The Lure, which is kind of how I was thought of it was like a lure is like a fishing lure. If you're from the Midwest, I guess you know, that. like you think of, you're like, oh, The Lure, that's an interesting name for a gay club. It makes me think <laughs> of like a fishing hook. Um, so yeah, I, I'm working with like a lot of names of clubs that have this kind of like double meaning in fishing culture <laughs> and making a fishing boat um, that also like coincides with this. I do a lot of, I really love playing with words. So it's a pleasure cruise fishing boat. So it's just, yeah, it's just started, but I've done all of the sewing that you see, which takes forever because I make really thick seams. Um, in the studio. So it's been a great, it's been like, I couldn't believe it fit so perfectly in the studio. Right? <laughs> it was very meant to be. And then Adrian has a question in the chat. Just waiting for it. And then I have another, a ship at, in my studio that looks kind of like a Viking ship, which I also was working on in Sweden. And I was looking at Viking myths that were, that had like a queer bend to them. 
Um, and then I was also, I have a Dune buggy in my studio also, which I think is probably something that I picked up here, even though I don't have a Dune buggy, but obviously I see a lot of them out here. So it's like called like the Dagger Dune buggy, something or other, but it's like Dune, D-O-O-M, because of the apocalypse. So. Oh, Adrian wants to know if she can ask it because it's too much to type. Sure, I mean, that's fine with me. Yeah, just, uh, can we unmute? Why don't you unmute and see what happens? Okay. Get some feedback. Okay, I asked to unmute. Great, thank you. Thanks. Oh wait, here we go. Oh, there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> like released from my my silenced state. Um, thank you so much, LJ. That was really great. Um, I had a just a comment first, which I think is just you know, really amazing with the van piece to, that you made and installed to see how big it is. Because when I just saw the image, it really looks like one of your little embroidery squares. So I think that's just really fascinating to me. And I guess I wanted, I, I was interested in if you could talk a bit more about what that meant to like work on that scale. Obviously it worked that big before, but um, and then, and then the other question is also kind of about scale. I have a, a student that's on the call, and um, I'm, I'm just want want to hear you talk about like this how long it takes you to make the work, and you know, just any ways that you've fought off the pressures of feeling like in the art world that you have to like keep producing, or just strategies, or you know, just encouragement, I guess, for uh, for people that make slower, like more intense work that you can't speed up. You know, what what's the value? In it and and what's been the value in you kind of holding on to that integrity so yeah i think those are really good questions um you know it's funny because i make really tiny things or i make really big things or that that seems to be how i work as a libra and um so actually the small embroideries the i think the quickest i've ever finished one has been three months and that's when i only work on the embroidery and the longest has been a year um, because I'll work on them a lot when I have other, I always have a multiple projects going. That's just how I am. So they just, sometimes the, the embroideries take a really long time. They're full coverage and they're six by four inches. And then I think the thing that's been, that has to be talked about with length is that I've never had a consistent studio. And, um, so when I made that van piece, I really relied on either A, getting accepted to residencies, which I did, or B, the kindness of people to find me space to work on. And both of those things happened. And it was very much like making a project that big is just a huge team effort. It's, you know, you singularly get credit as an artist and really they're that light box project, there's like 40 to 50 people behind it. And the van, it's probably around about the same thing in terms of all of the support I get from space to fabrication. Um, even though I don't really work with an assistant much on my sewing stuff, every once in a while I'll bring people in and I had assistants on the van, um, not full-time though, just freelance. But it really took a long time because I didn't have dedicated studio space because in New York, how can you afford a studio space that's gonna have something that big in it consistently for years? Um, for me, like having the portrait show happen after 10 years of making embroideries with so many people that were, um, I mean, those portraits are of people I love and I get to care, like the show is called Carry You Around With Me or Carry You With Me because I carry them, like literally carry them with me wherever I go. Um, and I think it, you, I, I don't know. I just, it, I think I'm not in a rush because I really want to produce the work that in the way I want to produce it in a way that means a lot to me. And, um, you know, as far as like, I don't really pay attention to pressure from the art world very much. It's just like, not, I have like too many other things to think about, like my dogs or like food or, like actually enjoying food or like making my work, you know, it's like, I don't, it's not something that 
I, I let bother me, I guess, or maybe I'm just oblivious to it in a way too, because it's art is more of a lifeline for me. So I do it to stay alive and enjoy myself and to connect to people. But um, I mean, in terms of for your student, like I never thought I would have a gallery ever. And that was something that for a while I felt very insecure about like, oh, it, is this, am I just gonna fade into oblivion or especially approaching middle age? Like you always heard those stories. And um, I actually just joined a gallery and we laugh about like our courtship process because I thought they didn't want it, me at all. <laughs> like I was like, I don't, I, and that's what I, what I said to them was I make work really slowly. Like I can't make you a show every two years. It's just not gonna happen. I need years and years and years to make work. And they, I, they were like good with it, you know? And I haven't even set a date for the first show yet because I don't wanna put anything in the world that doesn't feel really solid to me. And when I haven't, when the few times that I haven't like checked off every single box, I've regretted it. And that hasn't been very much, it's been like twice but like those two times haunt me so um so i you know for me it's like i make the work has to be really solid and it's and making it and concept and where it's going and um with the portraits i really held out till it was like the perfect venue with the curators yeah. who actually really wanted to support it and then collectors actually backed the entire show in the book and they're like the collectors are phenomenal. They're I should I mean I should say their names like Pamela and David Hornick, who have an amazing collection of contemporary portraiture, actually found me through the dogs on Instagram, which is also good to know that if you put your dogs on Instagram, <laughs> that's actually what funds you. And um, and that's how the whole show happened. And and they're like such lovely people, also with so much integrity, and. Um, and yeah, a lot of people wouldn't show the portraits. Like they felt like they were like too radical or something like that. And even though they're embroidery, which always cracks me up, but it really was like, I waited for what felt like the right time and the right gallery and what's well, not a gallery is Pioneer Works and free admission. And I wanted all that to happen. So I, that's a long winded answer, but I mean, now since I'm in the desert and you're in the desert, now the goal is to like, the next step for me is to have a studio that's permanent because I'm too old to be hopping around anymore, I'm ready to commit. So, <laughs> and yeah, oh, and I was just gonna say, and Bernard's studio has just been like a model for a dream. So, no, uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure having you here. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing your work, but then also sharing yourself, which is what happens in Q&A. Yeah. It's always <laughs> when the stuff comes out, so thank you so much. Sure. And uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, forward to seeing you again soon, maybe even next week. Cheers. <laughs> Bye, everyone on Zoom. Cheers. Thank you.